I think the screw was. Uh, it should be good. So the last time that um, when we ended on Thursday, um, we were doing some plotting stuff. I showed how to do some pairs plots, uh, pairs of panels plots. Um, and then I realized after we did it that I might have left out a couple things that could be kind of useful for pl for plotting. So I'll show the, I'll show those today first, and then uh, we'll go into some uh, GG plot stuff. Um, so. Uh, Starting back off here, um, I was just playing around. This isn't in the other one that you guys have, um, so you might have to throw it in there. Um, but if we wanted to make a quick variable, we can use uh, the function sequence, and we can sequence it from 0 to 5, and we'll go by 0 0.25 values. Um, and if we run that, we'll end up getting an array. Um, look at it, it's just going to go 0 to 5 and has 21 components to it, um, just going up in those intervals. Right? Um, and then we can make two quick curves and we'll just make them uh, using a mathematical expression. So y1 is going to equal x squared, run that, it makes y1, and then uh, we'll do 2x plus 3, just kind of random stuff. Um, and then we'll make a plot, and the big thing about this is that um, this is uh, plotting with a legend. So that way you can, when you make your figures, you can throw a legend in there. Um, so if we wanted to plot, we'll do the function plot, and we'll choose one of the two that we want. Um, uh, I'll go with uh, y1 to start off with. So our x value is going to be all, all our x values, obviously. Um, and then y1, we'll say type equals L, so that means type equals line, so we'll make this a line plot. And then the next piece, we'll say that LTY equals 2, so an LTY actually determines how dashed or dotted your line is. So LTY2 gives a slightly dashed line. Um, LTY1 is just a straight line, uh, no dashes in it. So um, that's just another kind of piece of plotting that lets you change things around um, as you want to. Um, the next one uh, is PCH, and I don't remember what PCH means, so I will uh, R it, R help it, kind of like Google character that it, it will give you. It stands for, and it goes from one to a lot. It shows one in here as being 46, so I'm guessing it goes past 46, but there's a a lot of different values, so I'm just going to throw in PCH2, PCH2. it'll kind of change up what my symbol is. And then the next one I'm going to use is points. Um, so points lets you overlay, and I'll run plot real quick. So there's our plot. Um, we didn't throw any labels in it, there's no title, there's no X, Y, uh, so it's just going to put what it saw in there, Y1 is our Y label, and X as our X label. Okay, cool. um, and then, so then if we want to overlay more points on top of this figure, we can use the function points. Um, so points right here uh, is the function, and then we're going to do the exact same thing we did with plot. We're going to say here are all our x variables and all of our y variables. We'll tell what type, a PCH value, a line type. They don't matter what order you put them in there um, in terms of the graphics parameters. So we'll run that again. And it just throws in our 3x plus 2 line. So PCH is a graphical parameter, so we'll play around with it real quick. Mm -hmm. All it does is change some things. So we'll say, let's do PCH1 and plot, and we plot it. Oh, it's not going to change it very much. Um, I'll use this one. So sometimes they override other things. If I do 
if I get rid of line type, it'll do different things for when you're using different stuff. And really, if we zoomed in, um, we'll run this one. Oh, I guess I won't like it. Oh, I changed one thing. Line type PCH1. So it has a, a variety, and I'm doing a bad job picking a good example because I'm not sure what they all look like, but I think in here it has some examples of them. Yes, okay, so P PCH refers to these symbols. So uh, one gives you so a, a circle. Plotting character? Yeah, it's a plotting character. So one would give you a circle, uh, but because we have line in there, I guess it's overriding it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, four would give you an X, eight would give you a star. These are just all these different type of characters that you can throw into your plot to make it look nice or to differentiate between different lines that you have in there, especially if they were um, scatter plots that didn't have lines. Um, I just thought I'd throw all that in there. Uh, we'll do this again, line type equals two. PCH we had was four, which supposedly should be an X, but the line type is gonna override it. Um, if I went back and did this, this should work. Or maybe not, I don't know why it's doing that. Oh, it's because I have this in here. I need this to be points. Okay, there we go. So as long as it's, if you tell it's gonna be points, then it'll switch it over. Um, but there are some examples that I've seen where there is a line and you change the PCH type and it actually will do different things. Um, so there's certain combinations you can flip and flop. So there's a lot of different graphical parameters basically that you can use. Um, so if I go back, say this is a line again, I think I had line type equals two, I'm just gonna leave PCH equals four. It doesn't actually do anything, turns out. Um, and then we throw the other, well, we'll redo that plot and we throw the points in there, now we can come and make a legend. So the first piece of uh, legend, we ask legend what it does. Um, the first uh, characters that it asks for is X and Y, which is basically where's the location that your legend's gonna be. But there's another way you can do it, you can just say um, top left, bottom left, top right, bottom right. Um, I tend to like those, and usually those are the spots you want your legend. So in the very first place, I'll put the position. I want the legend to be on the top left. And then the next parameter is going to be what do I want to label things. And you have to do these in the correct order, or else it'll screw it up. So I know that Y1 is the first one that I plotted, and then I know that Y2 is the second one that I plotted. So I put those in as characters and use the C command, concatenate command, to put it into one. Nice object. Uh, the second part, I have to tell it what are the line types of each one. So the first one, the line type was two here. Um, and actually, I think I meant this to be two again. The line type was two, and then the second line type was one. So they correspond to those exact same ones again. And then the third one, PCH was two, and PCH is four. Right there, concatenated, all referring to those same ones. So if I go back and plot this, and then I add the legend to the top right, um, it will give me what is actually happening. Apparently the PCH is so small, but it will pop up in the legend, so it's supposed to have triangles and X's in there. Um, but so it's saying that the first line type, the dashed one, um, the dashed one is Y1, so that refers to it, and the second one, Y2, is the solid line going right through there. And just so this actually looks nice, I'm gonna get rid of all the PCHs, but it was just an example. Um, you can throw all these other ones in there. Make it look all nice. Okay, so we've got our dash line, our solid line, um, and our legend in there telling us which one was which one. Um, and we can do this much more robustly with better examples and stuff. This was just kind of so right there we have a plot. Now the next thing is you make a plot and now you want to make a plot that's going to be paper worthy and great and great resolution and all that. Uh, so the way that you do that in um, R, and there's some other ways as well, uh, is with a function, I always do it as a PNG. I was told that's the best way and I never looked into it so I always do it as a PNG. 
you can actually make PDFs out of R2, so you can save figures as PDFs. Um, but so this function right here, PNG, uh, you call that, you name it, whatever you want to name it. So I'm going to name it stuff dot um, PNG, and you must have the dot PNG in there, or else it's not going to be a PNG file, and that would be not good. Um, and then the next parts are you want to tell what is the width of the figure going to be, and what is the height of the figure going to be. Um, these can get a little bit tricky when you're putting these into um, different documents and stuff. Basically, it's going to look at your your graphical parameters, and if I made the width really, really wide, it would stretch all of this out and make it kind of look funny. If I made it really, really, really big, um, all of these pieces would be very, very small when I actually looked at the uh, PNG, it'd make this part really big. Um, so it's something you can play with, but all you need is the width and the height, and then you have to give it the units. You could put centimeters in here too. Um, I chose to just throw in inches, so units equal. And then the last piece is the resolution you want of your figure. So um, in here I'm putting 400. Um, and so when you open up a, let's see, I'm going to plot something just completely random. Uh, one, two, three, two, four, five. Okay, so there's a plot. When you open up, when you run this command, so I'll run that. It opens up a device on your computer and says, okay, let's start saving and printing to this PNG file. So I've opened that up. As I run the plot, it's not going to plot on this because it's plotting onto the computer. Um, so it runs through all of that, and then the last piece you have to say is you have to say device off, um, dv.off off. And then I'll report out our studio graphics something too. And so if I go into my files that I had here with my uh, directory, if this is my directory, I'll ask it. Okay, so it should be in there. Yep, there it is. So there's stuff.png. So now I can click on stuff.png and see how it turned out. There it is. All nice and pretty. And now you can export it anywhere, do whatever you want, put it in LaTeX, who knows, copy paste into Word and waste a lot of time doing that, and then realizing you did everything wrong, you got to do it again, copy paste, oh, it's a mess. So um, there are some other cool things that maybe we'll show later in our sessions about using LaTeX and R together um, that work really nice. Um, now, I guess to give a quick example, if I change the width here to like 40 and the height to 40, I'm not really sure what this is going to do, but we'll check it out anyways. Um, so it'll resave it. It'll resave over that PNG. Um, and my computer stuff. Who It's processing. The whole thing just died. <laughs> it's not even moving, so we'll see. The what? Change the height to O. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's exactly what you mean. Because then it does the points and the line at the same time. Okay, 40 was a little too ambitious. I think 40 was too ambitious. That is the thing I didn't think about. Because I'm crashing the computer now. But it's going to be a really nice PNG, I guess. I don't know. resolution that you want to actually um, increase a lot because uh, I know like right now I'm writing some stuff and I'm making figures and putting them into um, LaTeX and uh, really one of the things is if I make a really big width and I write in LaTeX that I want to put the figure to the width of the text and so I say 10 and I put it in there and all the labels are really small if I go back into my code and change it to say 5 and I rerun everything then now my labels became big because it's taking a um, smaller figure and fitting it in there real nicely, whereas a really big figure and cramming it down in, and then it kind of shrinks everything. 
Um, but if you have a very big figure that has a lot of things going on in there, you need more space to make sure that things aren't overlapping, that your axis, axes aren't overlapping, um, and all of that. And uh, this seems to be a fatal flaw um, of uh, tea time here that I just ran at. So. <laughs> It is, I can't move the mouse, so <laughs> it is dead. Reboot. It is dead in the water. Did I save this? I really hope I saved this. Well, anyways. Uh, it doesn't say you saved it to the little I know. Well, so I just, I, I hit control S uncontrollably all the time, so I might have got it in time. Decent. And I just changed it to 40, and hopefully that didn't save, because that just destroyed my computer. Okay, so. So while Ethan is rebooting, uh, we've been broadcasting these on Periscope, and that so you could either watch live if you weren't sitting in the room, and then we just figured out how to uh, rip TF files from Periscope and put them up as YouTube playlists, so you can go find the whole history of these as you go. And we also just made a Git, uh, Bitbucket repo, Git repo of the codes and all that. Yeah, so in, in things to come, uh, right when this starts back up, I'll introduce everybody to ggplot, which is kind of the really nice um, plotting capabilities of R. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Jack is going to start talking about Git, um, and also hopefully we'll start actually using a Git repository to do these classes. Um, so uh, Git is a, a versioning software um, that's really nice, and we have our repository in Bitbucket, um, and basically it allows you to work dynamically in a team and do version control. Um, so we figure we might as well make a repository, have everybody pull it onto their computers all the time, um, make whatever changes you want, push it back up to your own repository so you can have it all the time, and then every new class that we do will upload new interesting inf information as well as the classes and everybody can pull it so you can actually get some experience in using um, Git uh, and uh, Bitbucket together as repos. Um, and then you can start using it with your work. It's really nice because it actually saves it and if your hard drive blows up, it's on a repository. And um, What's really nice too that I really like with Git is that I have multiple computers, probably about four, maybe five sometimes that I'll be working on separately in different places. And so I can make changes, push it up to um, Git, go to the other computer, pull it all back down, it's all version. I can make my other changes, push it back up, pull it down to the other side. Um, really kind of nice. So we can oh, this is such a poor computer too, to have this happen on. It does not have speed, it's just kind of a box. So. And then on um, Thursday, uh, I believe Tim, if, if we make it this far, um, Tim will start talking about our markdowns, which are um, basically the ability to write code inside of a plain text document and compile it all and basically generate a, repo uh, a report, a uh, PDF or an HTML that has all your figures in it, code if you want to show it, um, as well as just uh, typical prose of um, what's actually going on, on in your report describing the figures. Um, it's based with LaTeX, right? I think. So. All right, let's go. All my things are trying to open. This was bad over the weekend. I was doing something worse with breaking my computer. I was running loops that continually added additional columns and 
uh, rows at the same time to the point where it was adding, uh, it was allocating 550 kilobytes per additional column added uh, in memory. So that crashed my computer and I did it three times before I realized what was actually going on. <laughs> Studio. Yeah, so there's, it just rebooted from whatever, oh, I guess I clicked it three times. Oh. Yeah. One of them will have what I just was doing, or it should. So I guess we'll see which one. It's probably not this one. takes like 20 minutes. I can just get on my BDI. CNC portal I think has that. Or CNC portal has my It's still it's still not up. It's kind of crazy. I should throw this thing away. <laughs> this could take just as long.
Okay. All right. I think we're good back to get, good to go. Except for this doesn't have anything of the stuff I was just doing. So um, the next uh, part of this is talking about ggplot. So um, got to install that package. I think it's already installed on here. Um, it's ggplot2 is uh, the current one on, is the, is the newest one, the best one that's out there. Grammar of brackets, gg. So ggplot is in there. Um, so here's some example, this is an example data set. Um, it's called Iris. Um, I can't remember if it comes with ggplot or not. It's part of the base R. I think it's, yeah, it's base R, so you should have it either way. Um, if we just looked at the top of this, it has uh, pedal length, uh, pedal width, or um, Another pedal length, pedal width, this is something else. Sepal length, I don't know what sepal means. Uh, but just some different species, some different stuff in there. Um, and what we can use in ggplot, the, the first one is called qplot. So qplot is quick plot. Very similar to your base R graphics, but it just right off the bat kind of looks um, nicer. Uh, so in here we're going to say that the data is iris. Uh, we're going to plot uh, the, the sepal length and the petal length. So we're plotting that. This is our ggplot. Looks a little bit nicer than your typical base graphics already, and we barely even did anything. Um, so the nice thing here is that uh, it likes to put a grid behind it with some ticks, a gray grid, it's more aesthetic looking. Um, some nicer um, dots in there, which is kind of uh, nice to see. And then we can get a little bit more interesting. So what ggplot allows you to do is to specify different things um, and make things happen much easier. So for example, the one additional thing we'll add in here is that the column species is going to change depending on color. So if we run that one, not that highlighted part, but the whole thing. It is now going to look at all the different species and what the data is associated to it, and it's now going to tag all of them um, with uh, <coughs> what they are and a color. So it's all uh, Virginica in there, and so those are going to be all blues. Uh, Versicolor, those are all our greens, and then the reds are setosis. Um, and if we look at this again, iris. So in here it has all these um, petal lengths and the sepal lengths, whatever those are, and all the different species. And this is a data frame that we're looking at. Uh, ggplot is made specifically for data frames. Um, it likes data frames. It can use data frames really well. So what it's doing is it's the first thing is it's going to plot all of these by both of this, and then it's going to go through this column and tag everything individually by whatever color it sees. So it's going to look at this column and say, oh, there's three different things in here. We're going to use three different colors. We're going to assign a color to each and then assign them. Um, and so ggplot is able to do that very easily. Uh, and now we can go another step. So we have length. They're both of the lengths. The data is iris. The color species, OK, same thing. Now we're going to say that let's make the dots a particular size based on the pedal width. So all we have to do is add in there that size is going to be um, correlated with pedal width. And we run that. And now we're giving another legend over here with the different pedal widths and the sizes they are. And all of the dots in there have those particular sizes. And they're also colored. 
So now we can look at the species and the sizes at the same time by adding like 20 characters max into our code, um, which is really nice to do. And now, for example, here we have all circles. If we wanted to yes. add another parameter, so we take, I don't know, what's another column that we, we only have four columns, but if we had another column and we wanted to do another parameter, can we change, for example, the shape? Yeah, you, you can change the shape. Um, you would just say, like, PCH, that one. Um, so PCH right now is defaulting to a dot, and you could say, well, let's do four, which is a X. And now you can make all of these Xs. So they'd all be Xs on there. They'd be Xs in different sizes and in different colors as well. So you can change this to be whatever type of symbol you want in here. I was thinking um, more like if you have another dimension, so let's say another Oh, column. yeah, another dimension. So, because you were looking at one, two, three. Let's, so as you get good at this uh, GG graphic, uh, grammar of graphics, you can basically encode lots of extra information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Because you can also change so that there'd be three different symbols for those mm -hmm. different ones. Yeah. You can put density onto them, the dimension, and things like that. But anything you have a lot of circles that are overlapping, they mm -hmm. soon become dark. Yeah. So you put gradient color in them by how strong they are, and yeah. things like that. Um, this may or may not work. I'm actually, I've only used ggplot for about a month, which is unfortunate because I've been coding in R for about two years, um, but I finally realized how useful and nice it is. Um, so let's see, I'm going to throw one other thing in here and see if it works. So alpha, um, alpha is typically uses the density parameter for the color that you have. So um, if we put alpha in here equals the last one we have is, I think, sepal width is the last one in there, because there is one more. Actually, the next one might be using alpha. Unknown parameters, oh, I put a minus. So now we added our last mm -hmm. parameter in there. And if we look at it and zoom, and you can continue, if you had more dimensions, you can continue adding dimensions. I'm not sure what the next thing you want, it, symbols could be one of them. But it's how it's this grammar kind of way of doing it that mm -hmm. this is very nice when you have very dense areas of plots and you'll get stronger color mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. And there's a whole series of cascading highlights. Yeah, so the only problem with using alpha in this situation is actually that alpha is a layering. So, um, like right here, that's dark. That's because it's layered, but it has nothing to do with what its actual um, petal or sepal width is. Um, so that, that's actually one of the deceiving things of using alpha in this case, but it also works there. Um, in other cases where you have a ton of data and it's all kind of overlapped, and it might be really dense in the center or dense over in the top right, but you can't really tell. Alpha is a really good thing to throw in there. It takes values between 0 and 1, and so you can make 0 0.001 really light, and that, that allows you to see density um, within your plots. So yeah, that's another interesting thing with it. Um, all right, let's move from that one. Let's see, what's the next one we have in here? Um, so this is actually uh, using alpha as well, so I don't know if this is any different than what we just did. Um, so this one actually, the next one, that parameter to do just the layering and not to use it as a parameter. So in the past one, we wanted to change our alpha density, how well you could see through it by what the sepal width was, now we just want to add this in there that we want to see um, when we zoom in on the plot, where is it overlapping, where is the density in there. That's all this one's doing. So this one doesn't come with a key because the density doesn't mean anything except for things are overlapping. And I suppose that's what the I in there is for. Um, we can also, just like usual, we can add um, Different 
axes, titles, all of that in Qplot. It is um, xlab and um, main, or xlab, main, ylab, just like it is in base graphics. Is the uh, is the primary name different in ggplot? It can be. Some of some of them are, some of them aren't. It's kind of a, a toss up on it. So if it's not working, it's probably because it's you know it's not. Um, <laughs> We can also save these as objects too. So, um, and this is an interesting thing that you can do. So I can say that plot one equals this Q plot. And um, I think, yeah. So we can save it as an object actually, and it's just gonna sit there. And whenever we want to plot it, we just say plot one and it pops up. So that's kind of a nice thing you can do, saving your plots as objects. Uh, it makes it easy to do for loops with plotting. You can make massive lists and just kind of push away all your plots as you're running all your loops, and then later you can extract them all and put them into PNGs or whatever you see fit. Um, so that's another nice thing here. Um, let's see, what's this next one? Yeah, that's another Q plot. I can't. I wrote, I wrote this up though. For, all right copy pasted this the other day, I was getting this from some nice examples, um, and I can't remember exactly what I was putting there. So we'll go to uh, empty cars, which we were um, doing before, this just gives a couple more examples for GG plotting, um, and I believe empty cars is still there. Uh, and one of the things that we noticed in the first one that we used, the species, that was actually a factor. Um, so that, in the data frame, the species was a factor, and the factoring is what it allows us to then use, uh, to say, hey, separate by species, which are characters. The factoring lets us put those into kind of chunks. So in this one, uh, this particular line is saying that, hey, you know, we want gears, which were originally just values of three, four, and five. We don't want those to be numerical. We want to label them as three gears, four gears, and five gears, and we want to call it a factor. Um, so we label that as a factor so we can differentiate those later. So we run that. Um, automatic manual doing the same thing with it. And so we can do a Q plot, miles per gallon, the data is empty cars, and we can do a lot of different things right here for it. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so here's what we just did. We wanted to know the density distribution of how many cars um, exhibit miles per gallon um, parameters in three years, four years, and five years. Um, so it's kind of nice, it makes a a line of the density distribution of how many are there, and then uh, fills in with layers uh, the different colors and puts them over top of each other so you can see them behind and in front. Um, it's kind of a nice thing to do. There it is. And I think I'm going to skip all the way down to the stuff that I threw in here about um, actual ggplot because this is where it gets a lot more interesting. Qplot is what you probably want to start using first to get used to what ggplot's able to do. So on the drive, I put a file on there. Um, and this might take a second to find now because I'm not on my other computer. But it says uh, Noah Weather. So if you download Noah Weather, um, I'm gonna have to do it in here. Go to SDLET time. SDLET time, class presentations, our glasses. Hopefully, this is still here. Yeah, okay. So there's the weather. If you download this, now I'm going to have to go find it. This was all set up on this computer, by the way.
So we should be able, I should have this now in my downloads. I should be able to now read in that CSV file that was up there, noweather.csv. Just gotta take a second to switch the directories. save it where I just told it to be in it. Switch drive, downloads, save. All right, so this is an actual data set, real data set. It's from, um, I wanna say San Jose, California. It's two years of weather data. Um, I use it in my research for building energy, and so it should be in there now. It's going to read it in, and I just wanted to show you guys an example of how I use GG1. So I wrote, read it in as data.temp. I'm going to turn um, the date.time column in there to a POSIX CT. This is the, uh, the date format class that R uses, um, and that a lot of programs use. It has, it uses it from a uh, number of seconds since like January 1st, 1970. And so it allows for everybody to convert to different time zones and time frames all at the same time. Um, and it also allows for really nice plotting too, because if you plotted it, it'll throw down like three ticks over two years and tell you January, June, January, June, and those will be the only things sitting there. So. Now we're getting into ggplot. So I'm gonna say that data, and I'm gonna save it as plot one, because I'm gonna save it as an object. I'm gonna say data equals data.temp. And then comes the aesthetic, um, the aesthetic of ggplot. And this is where I think it gets a little bit confusing sometimes. So inside the aesthetic, AES, is where you define your x variable and your y variable. So I'm gonna say date is my x, y is temperature, and then I actually have two climates in there. So I'm gonna say that color is gonna be climate. And the guy who developed it, I believe he's British, so it's color. But I think color itself works just as fine. And then the nice thing, the other thing about ggplot is you can layer things. So I have a plus symbol on the end. In the other, in uh, the basic graphics, we put everything with commas. In ggplot, everything's with pluses, it's additive. So you make a plot and then you throw another layer on it and another layer and then another layer and you just keep on layering things on top of it, which is really nice, or overwriting it. So I just use a plus here to go to the next line and I'm gonna say, let's use this function called facet grid. It's gonna make two nice plots right next to each other. It's gonna label them um, and it's going to divide the plots by the two climates that it's seen. Um, and then scales equals free is just a thing to make sure that if one has one scale and the other one has another scale that they're free to make a nice plot. I'm going to say that the line size is going to be 0 0.75 and here's like a difference when I think somebody asked about basic uh, for ggplot it likes to see gg title and I'm going to say no temperature data for building climates. Um, you can tell the axis Theme is a very common command in ggplot. Theme refers to anything that's happening on the plot. Um, and I'm gonna say theme, access title, and I'm gonna say the text of it, I want it to be size 15, and I want it to be bold. Um, I'm gonna tell what the y lab is and the x lab label is, using pluses each time. And then I'm gonna say the plot title, I want it to be this size, I want it to be bold. Um, some other things, strip text is actually uh, some of the legend stuff. And I'm gonna say that actually I don't, I don't want a legend, so no legend. I'm gonna run this, and I'm gonna hope it works. And plot. It's a lot of data.
so that's a great question because directories are probably the first tough thing. Any directory that you want. So um, if you just downloaded it, um, the thing that I like to do is Control Shift H, and that allows you to go look into the directory. So in here we're going to go and we're going to grab. Uh, for me, it was in Computer Downloads. So go to your Downloads folder and select your Downloads folder, and it'll be in the right directory. All right. So now I just plotted it. It did two different climates. One is CSA, one is CSB. Um, it plotted the temperature on two different things. Um, I told it that I wanted some really nice, bold, nice to see in a paper uh, title and um, labels. And then also with the POSIX CT, it only plots a couple of ticks letting you know. So to, um, July 2012, um, 2013 January, and then all the way to 2014 July. Um, so POSIX CT is able to handle it really nicely. There's a ton of data in here. There's about 70,000 rows in there and 70,000 rows in there. Um, but it's able to handle it real nicely and put them right next to each other. It's kind of one, one of the examples. I'm curious what my next example was here. And I'll just run it real quick since we're like out of time. Um, and I don't think it's going to work because uh, there's an error. So. <laughs> So I'm just going to end it there. But um, basically, the thing to kind of know about ggplot, and I'll show a couple more examples before Jack starts with Git, is that ggplot is a layered dynamic. So you can continue to layer things on top of it. And the way that it wants to see things are in data frames. Um, so I don't remember what I put data.temp in. But I had all the temperatures in here, all the dates, and then all the climates. And this is a 140,000 row thing. And then this had the second climate there. And this had the first climate, CSB. So it was able to look at this data frame to determine which one went in which plot, and then it plotted them all. Um, so that's the nice piece of data frames. Any questions? Oh, we have questions. Uh, can you? Um, I've never used a data table. Um, I don't know if our, does our have a data table? It's called data table, you know? Yeah, there's basically two different um, concepts. One that they use the data table. Oh, yeah. So it's a completely different concept and I have no clue what it is, so <laughs> I guess I don't know. Um, but I'm sure it might be all right. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Functions. Yeah, I can show you right after. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right. I think that does it. Uh, we'll do a couple more quick ggplot examples that are nice, and then uh, Jack will show Git, which is, I think, one of the most exciting pieces of what we do.